anyway, this is the final message in this series, Running with the Giants. And I have had a blast studying uh, for this series and as well as watching the benefits of the lives of people in the church. Did you, do you feel like you learned some good stuff out of this series? I think it was a, a ton of fun. And, and my prayer is that you felt encouraged. If you've never felt encouraged, I hope that you leave this place and you're like, man, thank you for doing that, in, that series. I feel like I'm okay now that I'm not as jacked up as I thought I was because there's some Bible characters that are just as messed up as I am. Amen. And, and so, uh, and I hope that you learned your Bible a little bit better, but we've been using a theme for this entire series. And so I want to read that this morning, Hebrews chapter 12. And it says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race. I got a little bit of a ring. The race marked out for us. And, and we've been talking about if one of these giants in this faith could step out of the stands and take a lap of our life with us, what they might say to encourage us in our walk with God. And so today we're going to talk about Rahab. And it was funny, Dijon and I were laughing because she does all my graphics. And when you write out Rahab, your spell check doesn't pick it up. And so everywhere I have Rahab in my notes, it says rehab. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, so rehab or Rahab, whichever could probably help us all. Amen. <laughs> and, and what's interesting uh, about uh, Rahab is that she was a prostitute. And a lot of people miss this. And, and are you ready for this? She was a prostitute. She had all kinds of a jacked up past, and she winds up being one of the great, 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 great grandmothers of Jesus. So, so I said that there's some people that, whoo, there's hope for me. Come on, amen. That's what you should get out of that. And, and, and how does a person go from being a prostitute to being in the same lineage with Jesus Christ, that's, that's just crazy. Those things, in my mind, it, don't, it, it doesn't add up. When you get real, real religious, that doesn't make sense. And so what in the world would a prostitute have to say to us? And I think one thing that she would say is that my life didn't start off very well. In fact, my life started off in a very, very dark way. And I didn't like the way my life story was being written. And so I decided to change it. I didn't like the way I was going. And so I decided to change it. Come on, somebody. And so this message this morning is for when you're disappointed with the way your life is going. And, and I believe there are people here today that are like, I'm not liking my life story so much, Pastor Todd, and, and, and this can't, what's going on in my life right now? This can't possibly be what God has in mind for me. I just don't understand it, how this could be God's will. And, and we know according to Psalms 139 that God has a life story that he has written out for us and that God has a plan. And it says, all the days for you were written in God's book before they came to be. Now, some of you were thinking, are you telling me that God wrote this? And the answer is probably not. If your life is full of chaos and confusion and all kinds of messed up, jacked up stuff, probably not. The truth is God has a beautiful story written for your life. And, 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 but we have to add, a, <laughs> we have added a few chapters. God's got his book. And what we do is we come along and you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to put some cliff notes up in there and I'm going to add to take away. Come on somebody and, and, and put this thing in there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and here's the deal. I think when, when we start writing our life story and it goes in a disappointing uh, direction, well, that's, that's, that's just it. This is the best it's ever going to be. I guess I'm just going to have to be this way forever or, or my life is never going to take any good changes. And so, so we just give up and, and, and we like don't know what to do. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. Give your life to Jesus. 
Give him control this morning. Give your life to Jesus. But it's, you say, well, it's, it's not going to get any better. I just, I'll just hang in until I get to heaven. You probably don't get invited to a lot of parties. That's not true. Rahab would come along and say, my story started off horribly. We know. We, who knows why she got into prostitution? Who knows how she got there? I know that desperate people do desperate things. And, but I guarantee you, every time that she was a man, she felt the pain and the shame. And she did not like how her life was going. And she ends up being a great, great, great grandmother to Jesus Christ. I think she would tell us, let God write your story this morning. Turn over a new leaf, man. Put the pen in his hand. Let God write your story. And so I want you to see this next verse. After the theme we, that we've been using, watch this, Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Now, there's a moment in your life where, where you got to get that pen out of your hand and you got to put it in God's hand and say, look, I trust you more than me. I think you've got a better way of doing things than, than I do. And, and there are a few keys in the story that, that tell us how this can happen. Number one, if you're a note taker, this, here it is. God searches for you to be in his story. Boy, that's good news. Man, my God, that is good news. God is looking for you to be in his story. And we have to put the pen in his hands. But this happens because he initiates the process. Are you with me? When I got saved, I wasn't looking for God. God came looking for me. I went to master's commission to prove a pastor wrong. Brother John Murdoch at Christian Life. I went to MC just to shut him up. I wasn't saved. I was still selling dope. I was driving back and forth between Pampa and Lubbock uh, and meeting in Tulia to pick up my dope money all the time for my buddies that were doing this. And, and we did a series on the holiness of God and, and on Isaiah chapter 6. And that's what brought me back to God. He came searching for me in the middle of my darkness. And that's exactly what happened to Rahab. Come on, somebody. Rahab was a prostitute and she lived in a house that was built in the wall of Jericho. Now, Joshua was leading the nation of Israel. Moses is dead and and they are reclaiming the land and they're going to go fight for Jericho. But first they want to see what they're up against. And so they send out two spies to look over the land. And these two spies go out and they end up staying at Rahab's. Now, Rahab wasn't searching for them, but they ended up at her house. Why? Because God had a plan. I wish somebody would catch me this morning. Because God had a plan. God made sure that the place, catch this, nothing just happens in the kingdom of God. There's no such thing as coincidences. And can I tell you, as much as you would like to think it, you're not here today by accident. You're here by divine appointment. There is something that God wants to do. And so he set you up to be here today. God made sure that they snuck into the city of Jericho and it just happened to be the window of her house. What are the odds? Pretty high when God's in charge. And I say that because I believe God has been coming after many of you and, and, and he's saying, isn't it about time that you let me have that pen in my hand? Isn't it about time that you let me see what, or, or for you to see what I could do with your life if you'll, if you'll just yield it to me? I'm, I'm ready to rewrite your story. I'm ready to do it brand new, but you're going to have to allow it. The book of Revelation says that he stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. He could bust your door down if he wants to. He's God, but he doesn't do that. You know what he does? He says, how about this Sunday? How about today? Isn't it about time that you meet me? I've been looking for you. Come on, somebody. How about today? You need to know that God will search after you. But, but, but here's a warning. God doesn't always do that. In fact, the Bible said that God's spirit doesn't always strive with man. Now, that's a scary place to get. You don't want to get to the point where the Lord's not trying to get your attention no more. 
He gives you moments of opportunities. And for some of you, even for some of you Christians, you've known for a while that it's time for you to do a certain thing, maybe, maybe change jobs or get involved into leadership or serve or lead in the community group. And, and you're at a set intersection of your life and it's getting dark. And I'm telling you that Jesus has been after you. And here's what he said about it. John 15, 16. He said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, to have fruit that will last. My God, that's a good word. He's saying, I have I've got a great plan for your life. If you'll just trust me, trust me. Here's the second thing we learned from her story. God always makes a way for us to be in his story. Not only is he searching for us, he makes a way for us to be in it. It's not enough for them just to show up at her house. There had to be a way for her to get this rewrite of her story. So after they spied out the land, they came back and, and, and they say, hey, don't tell anybody. You can't tell nobody this. Because if you go tell somebody this, it's going to go bad for us. And, and don't tell anyone this. We did this because we're getting ready to leave, but we're going to come back. And when we come back, we're coming back with an army and we're going to destroy this place. We're going to level this place. And she says, uh, I don't want to die. I'm not ready to go. What? Help me help you. Come on, somebody. <laughs> what does that look like? I don't want to die. And, and, and they say, okay, this wall is going to come down. But we'll make sure that you and your family are safe. But you're going to have to swear oath. Watch this. Joshua 2.17. The men said to her, this oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land, you have tied the scarlet cord in the window through which you will let us down. Now, the scarlet cord is mentioned all throughout scripture. It's always a symbol of the cross. I hope you're catching this. It's always a symbol of the cross. And, and can I tell you, I don't know who this is for, but this is one of my favorite things to say. The blood of Jesus always makes a way. I said, the blood of Jesus always makes a way. Can you say amen? amen. But, 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 but he says, verse 20, if you tell what we're doing, we will be released from this oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and, and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. Now, the rest of the story is a great read where, where the walls come tumbling down except for one section of the wall where Rahab's house was. Why? Because she applied the blood of Jesus. She tied the blood of Jesus. Come on, somebody. She applied the blood of Jesus. She applied what God did for her as a way out. And if you don't like the way your life story is going right now, there is a way out. But the only way out is the blood of Jesus and the name of the God. In the name of Jesus, it's the blood of the Lamb. That's the only way. There is no other way. I don't care what this world is teaching. I don't care that you're telling you that you need to believe in a new age God or you need to believe in Allah or you need to believe in Muhammad. Muhammad. His name is Jesus. He's the same today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter. He's never going to change. He's the only way. He's the truth and the life. Come on. Somebody give God a good shout of praise. There is no other name but the name of Jesus. Don't you let some fool, foolery stuff come around and try to tell you there's more than one way to heaven. It might appeal to your flesh. But it doesn't change God's word. God's word's always our authority. So you want to know if somebody's telling you something straight, go back to God's word. And if it don't line up with God's word, quit answering the phone when they call. I am not talking to you no more. You a devil. You trying to keep me from my purpose. Listen, you keep doing it your way and it's going to get darker and darker. But if you would give him a chance, the Bible says that Jesus has a way of taking all of your bad days and turning around for his good. We know that because not only was she saved and her family, but she had no idea. She thought that that that, <laughs> that was all of it. But God said, mm -mm, I got more for you. She thought just because her house didn't cave in that that was the big thing. God said, I got more for you. He said, you know what? 
you're also going to be the grandmother to the son of God. Now, don't that mess up your day. I mean, you're a prostitute and that's some big news. You're like, evidently, he doesn't know what I do for a living, you know. Uh, and I guarantee you, she immediately started to start telling them what disqualified her. I guarantee you, she started to say, but y'all don't know this. And, 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 and I got this and I've done this and I got this many charges. And look here, you, look. Don't look on Facebook, look on Crookbook, and you'll see my, my thing on there, and I done there, and every drug dealer in town knows me. I got kids by four or five baby daddies, and I, I don't know who none of them are. Yeah, there's no way you don't, you, you got the wrong girl. Was it not you that applied the blood of Jesus, Rahab? Yeah, well, when you did that, that wiped out all that. <laughs> when you put that cord out, that wiped out all that. So I don't, we're not interested in who the baby daddies are because we know who the father of all is. Come on, somebody. I can redeem that. If you'll give it to me, I can redeem that. Whatever it is, God's saying, I can redeem. But you've got to give me the opportunity, which leads us to number three. God's story always has a redemptive ending. Always. Don't miss that. Redemptive to mean it's better than what you think. She thought she wasn't going to lose her house. She had no idea she's going to be the grandmother to Jesus. God doesn't just want to forgive your sins. Giving your heart to Jesus is not the end of your spiritual journey. It's the beginning of your spiritual journey. It's the beginning. God has so much more in store for you than you can even imagine. In, in, in line, she's like, the 28th great, 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 you get the picture, okay? We actually see her name again in Matthew. Matthew starts off with a genealogy and he starts off with Abraham. And then he wants to show that 42 generations later that Jesus is the descendant of Abraham. And in this list, he mentions 42 dads of the grandfathers of Jesus. He inserts only four women, only four grandmothers, not 42. Why only four? And why only those four, Todd? I think it's because Matthew didn't have that great of a start either. Matthew was a tax collector. And you know how those accountants are. <laughs> Brother David, you know, don't you? tax collector. Matthew, the tax collector, wanted us to know that in the lineage of Jesus, there's not all these perfect people. Matthew 1, verse 3, Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Go read that story on your own tomorrow in, in, in Genesis 38. It's one of the darkest, ugliest stories that you'll ever read. And Tamar ends up being a grandmother to Jesus. Go check that out. Verse five, Sol Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Ruth wasn't even Jewish. She only had the right bloodline. And he lets an outsider in. Why? Matthew, the tax collector, wanted you to know that outsiders can get in too. It don't matter what color you are. It don't matter what your financial bracket is. Y'all not hearing me? God's not a respecter of people. He's a respecter of principles. And if you'll call out his name, no matter where you come from, he'll meet you right where you're at. Verse 6, David the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now, it doesn't mention her name, but you know who that is, right? Bathsheba. Bathsheba was bathing on her porch privately. She thought, while all the men are off at war, I'll soak in the tub a little bit, except David. And David, he was watching her with lust in his heart. And he had her husband killed in battle. Then he takes her as his wife. She didn't even ask for it. Bathsheba's the victim in this story. Come on. She doesn't ask for it. Imagine the grief of her losing her husband and being shamed by the king of the nation in that kind of way. 
What does all that mean, Todd? Why did Matthew insert those four names? Because he wanted you to know through Tamar's story that God will forgive your darkest sins. And he wanted you to know through Rahab's stories that God will use you regardless of your past. And he wanted you to know through Ruth's story that God will not leave anybody out. And he wanted you to know through Bathsheba that God can heal any situation and he can turn your story around. Somebody ought to give God a good shot of praise. The next time you feel that your story is dark, just remember the four great-grandmothers of Jesus that didn't get put there by accident. And God wanted you to know that he can redeem anything that you got in your past. I think before she went back up to the stands, I think she would say, let him write your story. And she would say this, God invites you to be a part of his story. Join him. Say yes. Just say yes. I don't know if I'm called to do that. Just say yes. Say yes to the opportunities when they show up. The church is full. And when I say church, I mean church as a whole. The church is full of people who are praying about what they're supposed to be doing. And they've been praying for years and saying no to I don't know how many opportunities. It's like that dude when the rain's coming down. It's going to be a flood, man. You better get in the boat. No, I'm not getting in the boat. God's going to save me. Keeps on raining. Dude's on the edge of his house. Water's all the way to the roof. Boat comes by. Hey, get in the boat. Oh, boy said, no, I ain't getting in that boat. God's going to save me. Water's all the way up to the chimney. Guy sitting on top of his chimney. Helicopter comes by. Hey, man, you better get in this boat. Or in this helicopter, mm -mm, not doing it. Why not? God's going to save me. Old boy winds up drowning. Goes to heaven. He said, hey, God, I need some help up in here. I had the faith to believe you was going to save me. God said, I sent two boats and a helicopter. What else you want me to do? What are you saying, Todd? I'm saying this. When you get an opportunity, just say yes. You know how I got started? Toilet bowls need to be clean. Yes. You lying. Yeah. Come by on Wednesday and we're still all putting toilet paper in, cleaning it and whatever. When you get too good for this house to be a servant, you no longer belong. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I come to serve. Come out during the week. You'll see me. Out. How you think the weeds get out of the yard? Because I can't stand them. I'm out there picking on them. You should have seen me and Pastor Shane two weeks ago. <laughs> we was power washing that fake grass out there. And man, for the first time in my life, God answered my prayer. I went from being a white man to a black man. <laughs> I'm straight up. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it took... Even in Brenham, I'm preaching in Brenham, the pastor wife comes up to me. She says, I don't mean to offend you, but when you preach, you sound like a black man. I said, show me some love. Show me some love. Show me some love. Okay. Man, we power washed that thing. Brother Jeff, I thought, this guy came by and said, I do it for $400. I said, Shane, we can knock that out in two hours. I ain't paying somebody $400 to power wash that. We got two power washers out there. Started at 9 o'clock, 430. We're still doing that thing, man. <laughs> I quit for a little bit. Shane said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to write a check for $400. I, I am done. I am done. We just love to serve, man. Whatever the opportunity is, just serve. Just say yes. Whatever it is, say yes. Somebody say yes. yes. If he asks you to come be part of the story, say yes. Stop resisting God. Stop telling him how unqualified you are. He already knows when he gave you the opportunity. That's good, man. And, and when he speaks, stop resisting God. Some of you have been resisting God and you know that you are. And, and when I said that, your heart started racing when I said that. I know I'm resisting him. It's, it's, you know who you are. Fear will keep you from saying yes to Jesus. Jesus can rewrite your dark story. Look at this, John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It may not be perfect, but we will have light. 
I said, your life might not be perfect, but you will have light. Come on, somebody. We need that life of light. Well, Todd, how do I get that? Luke 9, 23. Then he said to, uh, to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. What's that mean? Give him the pen. Give him the pen and take up his cross daily and follow him. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. And it takes faith to do that. Give your life to God because he can do way more with it than you can. Go all in. Second thing she would say, God wants to surprise you with his love. So accept it. God wants to surprise you with his love. Accept it. I think with with all the people in the city that God purposely picked the prostitute. Can I tell you that God does that intentionally? He intentionally picks the darkest stories to use. Moses, the stutterer, can't even talk, but he knows how to murder people. Well, I'm preaching better than you, amen. And David, who wrote the beautiful Psalms that we read today, but we, he was an adulterer. Two-thirds of the New Testament written by a murderer of Christians named Paul. Why? Because he wants you to know that there is no place you can go that the love of God cannot reach. There is no place you can go that the love of God cannot reach. Todd, God doesn't understand where, he, where I come from. Yeah, he does. Hebrews 4.15. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through the weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy and accept the help. Take it this morning. Don't try to earn it. Just receive the love of God. Just sit back and drink it in. You can't earn it. It's a gift. Last thing, God wants, to love, wants you to love others with your actions. So serve him. Serve him. She would say, the best part of my life wasn't getting saved in the wall, but the best moment was, was getting to be the great-grandmother of Jesus. God has a plan for your life. And once God fixes your story, he wants to use it for you to help others that are usually in the same situation that you have been. You ever notice that? God will use your story to get glory and you'll be talking to ministering to people that have almost the same story that you have. That's not an accident. I, I, I want to do away with a myth that church people believe. And that's that you can't really do anything for God until you have your act together. Well, when I get it all together, I, then I'm going to get it. Anybody in here got all their act together? A lot of elders. I got some elders in here. I got some people. How many of you have been saved longer than 10 years? How many of you have been saved longer than 20 years? Keep your hand up. 30? 40? Uh, 40 in the back. Can I get 50? Can I get 55? Whatever. <laughs> How many have been saved longer than 10 years? Keep your hands up. Longer than 10 years. Any of you all got your act together? No. <sighs> Boom. Blew your myth up. I'm scared of you. If you come to the church, Debbie, if you ever come to the worship since the pastor taught, I'm ready to serve. Last night I got all my stuff, all my ducks in a row, and I am perfect. My first thing would be, Brother Jeff's out of town, isn't he? No, I would not. I, I, would, I, just, I, just, I just land. I just land. I just land, JB. Nobody loves you like I love you. But I'd be scared of that, man. None of us are ever going to be perfect. One time. When that which is perfect comes to get us. Which is when Jesus comes. Until then, man, we're going to always fight the same fight. But here's the great thing. Jesus has over, already overcame everything we're ever going to encounter. So that if we'll lean on his strength and not on our own and we'll walk in his grace and not in our grace, we can be more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, which gives us strength. Amen. Come on, that's a good place to say amen. amen. If, <laughs> if your goal is to get your act together, <laughs> get in line with the rest of the church. <laughs> Pastor Todd, I, I can't do a, a community group. I got so many problems I got to fix first. Listen, people want to come to a group and hear from people that have problems just like they do. 
We are all in the same hospital. Just some of us have been in here longer than you, and I'm just a little more well, but I'm still in the same unit that you're in. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Been doing it 24 years. I'm, I, I'm in the same unit you are. I may be a little more healthier, but I'm still in the hospital. Okay? We need to remember that God wants to, to use the darkness to bring light to other people. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid his life down, laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our life for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brothers in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Serve. And, and, and when you do, that's when your story starts to turn great. When you begin to serve. Talk to anybody who serves here at the worship center or any church, and they will tell you, when I started serving, that's when my life story became great. Dr. Martin Luther King said this, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. You hear what I'm telling you? And when you do that, that's when your story becomes awesome. 1 Timothy 1.15, I'm getting ready to close. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his greatest patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. And I know you're here and you're like, you know what? I hear that. But, but what does God want in return? Surely, surely, Todd, God wants something in return, doesn't he? I mean, surely he does. Paul said, I'm in heaven, and he does want one thing. You ready for it? All honor and glory. You know what God wants from you? All honor and glory. To give you a clean slate, all he wants is your praise and your worship forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He is God alone. Can you say amen? God signs his name to your story. So you ought to thank him this morning.